So a very uh, warm welcome to all our participants joining us from different parts of the world. This is uh, part three of the Masters in Neurology webinar. And again, it's my uh, privilege to have uh, Dr. Heng Ching Tion, who is my head of the department, a very, um, very close person to me because he, he can tolerate me and then he supported me and he's mentored me. So it's good to have my mentor with me, my distant mentor and also who somebody I love. I uh, respect is uh, Professor Marik Arjun, who's also, you know, without whose energy, I don't think this show is possible. Apart from being the president-elect of the Urology Society of India, it's amazing how he's, he's everywhere. And um, it's, uh, thank you very much for that. And last but not least, I think uh, today's guest of honor, he's uh, Professor John de la Rosette. I think when we say uh, crows, automatically the name John de la Rosette comes first, though there are plenty of people who have been associated with it. And likewise, if we say SIU, we know the General Secretary of uh, Prof. Gelato said, without whose say, almost nothing moves in the SIU. So, Prof., thank you so much for, you know, I'm glad that I met you in the challenges of endourology many, many, many years ago. And I think that's an amazingly successful meeting. And from there, uh, we, you know, I take it as we've grown from strength to strength. And I welcome you. I'm going to invite uh, uh, my boss, Mr. Heng, to open the uh, stadium for us. Dr. Heng Ching Tiong. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, so I'm just going to start my screen share. Hang on, give me a second. Okay, so I think today's uh, topic is going to be very interesting because Crows is, uh, and the, the research that it produces is particularly unique. And when I think Crows, I think international collaboration, multi centers over multi different, multiple different uh, countries and not just one continent, but different continents. It creates a massive database. And it, the one thing it, it gives me uh, information on is real world practice. Uh, too often, sometimes the research is just based on one centers and who, who is trying to essentially push their idea. But what Crows does is that it does produce uh, um, information that gives me a reflection of what the real world is practicing. So for example, the URS global study, you know, 114 countries in uh, 114 centers will take two countries over 11,000 cases. They can talk about things like infection. It talks about things like obesity, stenting, and even just how case volumes affects outcomes. And things like this gives us an insight as to how the real world is working as opposed to just small, small uh, specialized centers. Similarly, and this is very interesting to me because my interest is in PCNL, uh, the PNL study group um, has enough data to look at things like even pediatrics, uh, the effect on PNL on chronic kidney disease, solitary kidneys, um, the time when supine versus prone was there, I thought I was behind the curve, but it was nice to know that I really wasn't when I was still doing super prone PCNLs. And the, the good thing with that is that it also came up with the normal gram for predicting outcomes. It's a really useful thing to look at. So um, a lot of information. And I think we've, we're good to have uh, Professor De La Rezette today because he can give us a summary. And, and I think this is his topic. So I'm gonna pass it back to Vinny to just uh, introduce our speaker. Yes, and uh, like I said, Professor Dela Rosad is the chairman uh, um, of SIU. Uh, he's the general secretary of SIU from 2016, and he works in um, Medipol University in Istanbul. He's a professor of virology. I think, Prof, you've got about 700 papers, and I don't know how many countless chapters, but today we are here to listen to you and take us through your journey with Crows. So without uh, further delay, uh, Prof. Sean Dela Rosad, all to you. Thank you. Um... I must um, honestly say that I was a little bit surprised when you uh, invited me to uh, give some secrets about, uh, about Cruz. Uh, the main secret behind this is actually all my friends all around the world that decided to contribute to this. I also was thinking how it actually started. I was on a train trip in uh, 2008 uh, from Paris to Amsterdam. And I was discussing with my wife um, about research. And I said, well, actually it's a pity that we are doing a lot of research, but you know, it's 
only a collaboration between two or three centers, and it's uh, and it's a little bit with um, with a kind of a, a retrospective nature. So I came up with the idea: Would it be possible to do a larger project with more than 100, 150 centers worldwide, and all these centers would collect data? The, the problem often is, is if you collect data, it's um, it's it's very demanding. So I used a trick. I asked all these centers to collect data initially on PCNL and later utroscopy, and the idea was it should be a snapshot analysis, which means you collect the neutroscopy data with a follow-up of three months, and that's it. And you do this for a year. Now, and urologists are very nice people. They're willing to do that. And the reason why they're willing to do this is because they are not like your oncologists, you know. They don't want to keep things just for themselves. They want to share. They want to share, and they want to show that they're doing a good job. So I'm going to share with you some of my, uh, my experience in the past year related to all this. And what are secrets? I think the secrets is I share with you what I learned since more or less 2005 and beyond, what you can do to collaborate in projects. I'm... Um, as mentioned, also General Secretary of SIU. And in the SIU, we also are now um, building a strong collaborative network. And I hope that this is also something that we are going to work together on with many teams around the world in different other fields. If you look at uh, research in general, um, when you look at that, you know that randomized trials are actually the highest you can achieve. But often we are discussing, like we will discuss later on in case discussions about expert opinion. In my opinion, we should do this or we should do that. If we're doing a little bit better, we look at a case series from our own center and say, hey, look how great I am. I did 50 of these, I'm fantastic, I'm the best. You can also say, well, let's go for a retrospective cohort study. And you see that happening at the moment, still 10 centers together, bring together that data, retrospective, and we all think that this is research. I have to disappoint you, it's not. It's not research, it's just filling up one's CV, you know. So, and if you um, look very carefully at the level of evidence, it's increasing the higher up you come in the hierarchy. But right now we are aware of the fact that registries are very important are very important because they really uh, present real life practice. In 2008, when we started this discussion, we also were aware of the fact that the quality of our surgical trials were really limited. And at the moment, you've got colleagues in place who discuss about methodology. If you want to submit a paper, it needs to be registered, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but also meet certain certain levels of, of, of quality. And at that time earlier, and we talk about 20 years ago, that was not really valid. It wasn't really there. And you see in this paper where Philip Dahm, and Philip Dahm is a highly respected colleague, he talked about quality of reporting of our studies. And it was being said that it remains suboptimal. Paper was published in Journal of Urology. It remains suboptimal. Suboptimal, so which means at that time, even randomized controlled trials had a problem. So forget about all the other studies. What we also should keep closely in mind, if we talk about studies and trials being conducted, that often take place in the so-called the developed world. I don't know what is developed right now, because I think all of us in these past decade became developed. But in the past, this was Europe, United States, they were dominating all the research. But now it comes, the beauty of that is, is that an important force to move clinical trials to the so-called developing countries, and, and that's not to say that they are not developed. It's just because in all the other countries, there is too much bureaucracy and they're very expensive. So this is the beauty for Latin America. This is the great power for Asia and certain parts 
in Middle East and whatsoever to take a, bit, uh, a bigger piece of the action. Now, if you look on this map here, this was at that time of close to a thousand centers worldwide shared all over the world, the, the cruise network, close to a thousand centers. But if you look very carefully, the majority of countries really contributing to the data set are highlighted in yellow. They're called the developing countries. And I must honestly say, I looked at Turkey and I put it there as a developing country. And I'm now working. I'm at the moment in Istanbul. This is not a developing country. It really has data, power, potential in place that overpowers many of the other countries. If you look at China, if you look at India, you look at India, a developing country. Are you crazy? The big companies looking at all vaccines development right now, looking at data management systems, information technology, they're coming from India, they're coming from China. So we have to look very carefully if we talk about developing countries whom we uh, uh, put the sticker on. Now, the question that came for many centers to me, they said, why should I do research? I'm a great urologist. I can do great surgery. Well, actually, the quality of our scientific work may be regarded as a kind of audit of our clinical work. How good are we doing things? Can we do better? Trials more or less conducted use specific protocols. More or less, these protocols help us also to be implemented in our daily clinical practice. And with this in mind, global research, not just coming with research in the so-called developed world, you cannot implement them globally and saying, well, this is how I do it in Europe. So this is how you should have the standards, let's say in India, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. I think this doesn't fit anymore. For a research, the first thing is you have to sit down and you have to think, how am I going to coordinate this? So in my early days in 2008, I was thinking I should create a global network. And then what I need is, of course, an infrastructure. You know, just to sit in my office with a resident, it doesn't work. But more importantly, I was looking for a supporter. And this is often done by a society that can support international research. And if it was in neurology, I reached out to the Neurological Society. And finally, of course, we always are discussing where does industry fit in? And we managed to create a structure where we partnered with industry. While we as society, as experts, as clinicians were in the lead, it were actually the the companies that were also discussing with us, sitting around the table, how can we learn from these data and improve our practice? What was needed for that research organization? Well, an infrastructure, as I said, a society. And the end of society has always been very strongly supportive from the beginning onwards. At that time, I was working in Amsterdam. I felt there should be an office manager, somebody who is like a spider in the web reaching out to all the different sites globally. We needed data managers. So at average, we had two data managers overseeing all the different projects. A statistician was needed, not just to do the analysis of the data, but actually to prepare the studies. The other thing, what I realized very early, that medical writing was important. If I would give the data to many centers, you know, the question was if you have a center, let's say in Turkey, is English their uh, native language? The answer is not. While they can prepare a wonderful manuscript, the problem is you want not to have the comment, please have a native English person review your data. So what we did is we invited a medical writer to help us in all this. We needed to have a data management system and we started that from scratch. And I will show you some on that. And then, of course, you need to have quality of your data control. We put an audit committee in place. And for this, uh, my good friend Glenn Premature was asked to chair that committee. What about publications? 
And as mentioned before, we had from the PCNL close to 30 publications. How do you guarantee that everybody gets a piece of the action? Well, at the end of the day, every center that was involved was at least in three publications. And if not, they could send me their complaint, but all of them with maybe contributing 10 patients, 50 patients or 100 patients, there were three publications. And that's amazing, you know. Who can promise you that with, with, with including 50 cases, you will be in possible three publications? There was a publication committee and, of course, a research council, a council overseeing all what we were doing. If you look at the data management system, it, it looks complicated, but it's actually very easy. The users should have easy access. The data managers should have easy access and we should be able to export the data in SPSS or th something similar. And we should have an update of the study metrics once every day, every week, whatever. And that worked, you know, we could provide all these updates. We created a website where you could have easy access. And then of course, everybody says it should be intuitive. So when you fill out the data, it should not be too complicated. And I must say, we succeeded in doing so. Again, this was not a package available. I don't talk about RedCap. Was it available in 2005 or eight? I don't know. This has been built since ever then. And then of course, the hospitals that participated, the patients that participated, they always asked, is it safe? So that whole system was password protected. It should have multiple data backup because what happens if there is a internet storm, it breaks down the system. You should be able to have data tracking. And at the moment we are conducting several studies where FDA wants to plug in those data. So it should be FDA compliant and it is. And then there should be a standard operating procedure guides for this data management system. It all was created from scratch. As we said, the audit pro program, as discussed here, you should have data quality. You should be really sure that when somebody puts in data, that it's valid, you know, that somebody not just makes up data. And we had a good system for that in place. And of course, there should be an in-house data analysis. Um, I must honestly say that the statistician, the data managers, they all worked in a good team effort to realize that. And with respect to the data, uh, the audit committee, as I said, monitoring is important, validation and quality control. So with all this in place, we could get started. Partnership with industry is important. And I must, as you see here, Mrs. Torts, who uh, has been very supported from the very beginning, but many other companies like Boston, Olympus, uh, AMS, at that time, Angel Dynamics, very supportive to these projects. Money was involved. So each one of these companies supported with half a million euros for three years. And in total, in the past years, we have been collecting close to 5 million euros, which means I had to go to the companies, I begged them to support, but actually I invited them to become a partner of our global research. It was in their benefit, it was in our benefit. The other thing what we learned is that you should have newsletters. So with the Journal of Neurology, we asked them to publish our work in a newsletter. So every issue I had to provide an update on a part of the study or one of the participants could do so. And then of course, the certificate of contribution. You know, it is amazing to see how even I can be very happy to receive a certificate of contribution for your altruistic support because you don't get money for this. What you get recognition is on a website, in publications, in abstracts that you or one of your residents can present at EAU, AUA, SAU, at a meeting in Asia, the uh, UAA meeting, or a meeting in Latin America. But that certificate, I've seen it hanging on many people's walls after their uh, conclusion. 
And then for the publication strategy, as I mentioned, we had an agreement in place from the very beginning onwards. We wanted to safeguard that there would be no discussions at the very end where somebody would say, hey, look here, why is he in the publication? Why is he leading? You need to arrange this from the very beginning when you start on a common project. And rapid publications was important. You cannot say we have a database with big data and then the publications, it takes you years. So that's why we had a publication committee in place and we also had somebody to help us to upgrade the quality of the data. And within the crews, the clinical research office of the end of society, we could conduct and did conduct randomized trials, registries, but we also took care of surveys. And you see here lined up all the registries that we took care of. We started with the PCNL, utroscopy, a renal mass global registry, a green laser global registry, an upper urinary tract tumor registry, one on focal treatment using IRE for prostate cancer, but we did three randomized studies. We concluded the one on narrow band imaging for bladder cancer. We are at the moment concluding the one on image 1S also for bladder cancer, supported by STORTS, and the one on a focal treatment IRE, again, a, a randomized study. So in this, as I mentioned before, registries are important. They provide real life data. Your participation is altruistic. You know, anybody in Europe, the Americas, Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, Australia, you can participate in this and the costs are limited and you need fast recruitment. Look at the timeline here, and now we're moving into the studies. Sorry for this introduction, but I think it's important to understand what is needed if you take this serious. And many other groups have tried to copy it. I say copy it, but they were never able to do the same. Even BAUS, a highly respected society, tried to do something similar. But then, and that's from the own audit process, but they never reached these sheer numbers at the at same pace. And, and it's also a recognition for the contribution of, of the end of society with the crews that many others tried to do something similar. Now let's look at the PCNL study. It was opened in 2008. The recruitment was for a one year period in each site as a snapshot. So in total, it was closed somewhere around 2009. The publications started in 2011. And why did it take time? Because the PCNL study closed, but you needed to have a follow-up of about a year. And then we started the analysis. We learned from that study a lot. So the utroscopy was a little bit easier. We opened it, we closed it, and we start much faster with publications. Let's look at some of the PCNL studies. These are the papers, and you can see published in European, World Journal, Journal of Urology, Scandinavian Urology, uh, Journal of Urology, the British. So we try to share the data with a vast number of different journals. Nomograms are at the moment being used by many. When we were looking at this analysis, where we can say, can we predict treatment success? Of course, it was felt that Arthur Smith should be the lead author in that. You know, the godfather of PCNL um, is, is involved in this work. And what we did, he also created his own data set based from the uh, hospital that he works in New York. But looking at this, you can see that the, a score was created based on the location of the stones, the number of the stones. But interestingly, we also included in this case volume. So how many patients did you treat? Did you, did you treat stack on stones? It, uh, that's again, a different animal. So, so looking at all this stone volume, and you'll see that later, is an important factor to talk about success of outcome. The other thing is that we realized that standardization of reporting doesn't exist in any urology. So if I say the patient is stone free after PCNL, well, in some literature you say, well, it should be zero, nada, nothing, no stone. 
But some of us say, well, you know, if the stone is smaller than two millimeter, it's stone free, which is strange. Because if you then compare the literature where somebody else is using as definition smaller than five millimeter, I accept that still a stone free in a stack on stone. That's that's weird. You will never be able to compare it. You compare apples to pears. And then how do you uh, evaluate the stone free status? Are you using ultrasound? Are you using CT scan? Are you using KUB? Uh, and, and some of them just say, I had a look at the renal pelvis. It was stone free. So we came up with strict definitions. So with all these wide variations and, and under specification that is there still, we produced this manuscript and said, well, this is what is being recommended. And this is what you should refer to. If you talk about stone free, you should say that I really know stones left. Dust, well, there's always a little bit dust after PCNL, but you could not accept fragments of one, two or three millimeters. The next project that we did was a very controversial one because the, not the, the topic was controversial, but the outcome. Because we looked at the tract dilatation comparison. And at the time we used often balloons. And we used balloons to dilatate to 26, 30 French. Now the question was, is there a difference between serial dilators or balloons? And then when we looked at the telescopic dilatation method, it seemed that there was a shorter operating time, balloon had longer operating time, and there was more bleeding and transfusion rates in patients treated using a balloon for dilatation. And there were many colleagues that said, that's impossible. It's not happening in my hand. So there is something wrong with the data. I don't understand this. And this paper nicely illustrated that if you just look at two factors in this and you don't go for a multivariate analysis, you can come up with conclusions that maybe are not that solid. Because the next step that we did is you looked more in detail at operating time and bleeding compl complications. And then again, the factor came back. What is causing bleeding? And look, here are the results. Number one, it's operating time. It's stone load that drives predictor of bleeding. Case volume is a predictor. The more you do, the less chance of bleeding. The sheath size category, so the smaller the sheath size, the less the bleeding. And now, interestingly, the dilatation method absolutely was not a predictor of bleeding. And now you understand why some people said, I cannot understand this. Now you understand that when you go in a multivariate analysis, it's obvious that the driving factors are operating time, stone load, case volume, and sheet size. And now we also understand why mini PCNL is becoming so popular because bleeding and bleeding is much less now. At the time we were working on this, there came this revolution, this wave. We should move to supine PCNL. And my good friend, um, uh, Jose Valdivia from Spain had been working for many years on the supine approach. The problem of his communication was that his English was not that good. So the publications were in Spanish in the beginning. There was no attention. And I was doing many um, life surgery courses. And I was asked, why don't you have a look at supine? And I did. And I must say, when I moved to supine, I switched in using it. But still the question was, which one is now better? Is one better than the other? What are the differences? And obviously, when you look at the data that were available in the literature, it says that prone PCNL achieved higher stone free rates. So it should be better one way or another. But it obviously is related to access. In prone, often you go in the upper and middle pole and not so often in the lower pole. While by supine, you often choose the lower pole for access. So it's more different, it's different actually to say to maneuver in the renal pelvis. But prone PCNL had higher comorbidity than supine PCNL. So you could say there is a pro and there is a con. So the pro was higher stone free rate, but maybe more bleeding or other problems that could arise. We also looked at urinary tract infections. 
you know, many guidelines give you recommendations. So what for PCNL, I will show after also for your troscopy. You can say that even if you use antibiotic prophylaxis, up to 10% of patients develop fever under antibiotic prophylaxis. So you have to maybe adapt your schedule a little bit. And it was as a risk factor identified positive urine culture, which makes sense. Stack on stones, yes, it's a different animal. And if somebody had a preoperative nephrostomy tube. So in these patients, you have to be more careful and maybe you leave them a little bit longer on the medium care. Or you use a different mix of antibiotics. But this was presented and concluded like this. What also is of important, you can say, well, if we talk about antibiotic prophylaxis, we also did a matched case uh, control study where we said, well, let's look at patients who didn't receive antibiotics at all. And I would say, this is crazy. Who's doing this? Well, there was almost 200 patients that didn't receive antibiotics, like a straightforward PCNL. And you ask yourself where? Well, even in developed countries, this helps. We could match those data because there is no randomized study where you say no antibiotics versus antibiotics. And you could see that the risk of operative fever in low risk PCNL is in favor of using antibiotics, two and a half percent if you use antibiotics, seven and a half percent almost if you don't use antibiotics. So it helps. And obviously, the guidelines supporting all this. The other issue that came up was how are we going to categorize our complications? You know, I have a little bit of bleeding. I have a little bit of uh, a leak or a, a bowel complication, or maybe a patient dies. He can die after PCNL. How do I categorize this? And we validated that system again with this database. We had to recognize for minor complications, there was a low agreement, but especially for the higher group of, uh, of complications, there was a very good agreement with that Clavin score. And it's now generally used. We also looked at the length of hospital stay. Higher grading score of Clavin was strongly related with longer hospital stay and also with the severity of complications. So this Clavin grading system can for sure be used for PCNL now. When I started my, my work, I always did about 50 PCNLs per year. And when I went to India or I went to China, people welcomed me as one of the big experts in stone management. And I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed because I go to a center that does maybe a thousand or 2000 PCNL and they welcome me as an expert. What? What's wrong with that? Well, wrong with that is the case volume, the sheer case volume. So we, we felt, let's have a look if that really is that important. And the conclusion was that yes, stone volume, case volume is important. The free rate increases with case volume. And that's what is indicated in this graph. But look, the more you do, the better you're on stone free rate. And then it's going down again. Why does this happen? Well. The logical explanation is the more cases you're going to do, the more complicated cases you're going to do. So obviously, when you do in your center 120 cases, you will have a good volume, but nobody, if you have a very difficult case, you may send it to one of your other colleagues who has maybe some more problems in that. Now, if you looked at uh, the probability of complications, again, you can see that the more cases you do, you see 300, the complication rate is going down. Again, it makes sense. And if you talk about uh, uh, case volume, again, uh, the maximum clavium score, you can see, again, a similar curve that more complications if you do more cases. So this registry gave us the power to come up with these strong conclusions, which you never can do if you do 50 cases at your own place. So the length of hospital stay is also shorter in high volume centers. So the more cases you do, the hangs of hospital stay is going down. Makes sense. So insurance companies in the future may say, how many cases are you treating? You say 10 a year, 
They may say, you may do that, but we don't compensate you for this anymore. And this is happening in many parts of the world right now. I selected some of the cases for PCNL. I didn't obviously cover everything on that. And for utroscopy, I briefly touched on them as well. So 12,000 cases treated in a year in over 150 centers. The interesting thing is that vitroscopy, again, is a completely different ball game. It has been established as a minimal invasive treatment with a high success rate. You can see a stone-free rate, whatever the definition, is 85% and over. And what is important, at a low intraoperative complication rate. The major might be bleeding, but you can see very rarely an avulsion <clears throat> and especially with the newer instruments, smaller ones, aversion has become very rare. We see that we have an increasing number of patients who are treated at older age with diabetes, cardiovascular disease. And you can see indeed here presented that diabetes is increasing cardiovascular disease at a certain stage is 80% in somebody who's 80 or 90 years, which makes sense. And you can also see that when you talk about cardiovascular disease, hypertension is here the driving force behind all this. Which patients are really at risk of complications? And again, you see that especially those who are at higher age, there is an increasing risk that they have complications. So when you treat a patient who has a two centimeter stone and is 50 years of age and somebody who is 90 years of age, you need to be very careful in both of them but pay special attention on the older patient because he has less bag up. Double J stands. Again, if you look on this graph here, you can see depending which use a double J stand post uh, 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 before the surgery. So if you look at all this, um, our clinical practice should be should be standardized but we all do something based on where we are trained, in which place, what are our customs, but also we look at cost related to that. Many of you know Enrique Perez Castro as related to the one who conducted the first semi at least publish on that. And you can see that here, you look at stone burden and you look at mid, distal and proximal yorto stones. The conclusion from that study was that your utroscopy for yorto stones resulted in good stone-free rates with low mobility. We are aware of this, but you need to, to publish on that. If you look at the single intrarenal stone, is it safe? And now you may argue we have different lasers. We have more powerful lasers whatsoever. We looked at those data, and at that time, many of us were using lasers as well. Obviously, for flexible vitroscopy, the cutoff was 15 millimeter. So if somebody comes and says, well, hey, I can easily do a three centimeter stone or stack on stone by flexible vitroscopy, he is a daredevil. The question is, should he really do this safely or should he recommend PCNL? We also looked at, um, at differences in the use of urethral access sheet. Should you use one? Should you not use one? If you look at stone free rate in this graph, there is actually no difference. So you cannot say with the urethral access sheet, I have a higher stone free rate. You also can notice here again that the use of urethral access sheet, depending in which country you are, is different. But it's important that it reduces complications and especially infections. What, whatever you want to do is you should have low pressure in the upper tract. Now, should you then, in, in, in India, I was going for a course and they said, we often have tight ureters. I witnessed that. There are often tight ureters in Asian patients. Should you have a double J stand before? Yes or not to decrease uh, complications. And I say, if you feel comfortable in your setting to do so, um, it, it's, it's not to be stopped if you want to have an uneventful procedure. We also looked at case volume now for vitroscopy, and this are moving to the end of my presentation. High volume centers, achieved better outcomes than low volume centers. But you see in this graph, the more you do, close to a thousand cases, the better you become, irrespective of the complexity. Irrespective of the complexity. The more you do, the lower the complications. 
if you look at all this. And if you look at length of hospital stay, you also can see the more you do, the less the hospital admission is. So again, high volume centers dedicated to stone treatment by utroscopy or perk. It's not just the future, it has to be here. We shouldn't say, oh, in five or 10 years, we will have this. We just see now that we have dedicated any urologists focusing on all this. So whom should we, should I salute for all this? I got the privilege to present it. Well, these are all the colleagues from all over the world, wherever they are, Turkey, Bulgaria, Australia, United Kingdom, Japan, that contributed to this work. And with this, in my position and capacity as General Secretary, I salute all of them and look forward that many of them are gonna continue and contribute to future research as well. So that was it. And I hope it's enough fuel for a good discussion. Thank you, thank you, Prof. I think that was uh, a very comprehensive uh, uh, review. I'm sure it's taken you back through time. You actually jogged back uh, right from 2008, two decades. Uh, it's been interesting to learn uh, many of these are uh, the factors that we still look at. I think we'll go, we'll start with the case discussions and I'm sure we'll merge in the questions if they're answered, we'll skip them from the audience as well as uh, uh, we'll probably be able to relate how all the studies fit in, in case discussion. Malik sir, if you'd like to start, sir. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just ended up, the summary of your whole talk was fantastic. I really liked John because I have not gone through so much of data of cross what you presented, but you summarized it so well. And in each and every part of your, each two, two major procedures which we go across, one is the PCNL and URS. I think many of the post graduates will be definitely be really, really helped because of what the data says. It's a very common practice that somebody says three centimeters tag on, I can do a URSL, I can do a flexible electroscopy. But I think you should be a daredevil, but what matters is at least ultimately the safety is, which is going to be prime requisite, prime importance of the whole thing. Let me, let me come to my case discussions part. And uh, that's it. First case, a 40 year old female presented with right flank pain, recurrent urinary tract infections before, and a right renal calculus on ultrasound. And they got an IVP done, which shows that there is a filling defect inside the pelvis at this point. Any comment on this, whether you want to do any more investigations before you treat this? It's a large filling defect, possibly say two, three centimeter size stone. Will you do something, John? Uh, so the first thing as a comment I would make is, is this infection really related to that stone? Mm -hmm. um, because you should keep in mind, if I see a patient like this, I ask, that if it's a, it's a lady, of course, do you have recovered urinary tract infections in general? She's 40 years of age. And the other thing is, uh, I, I, I collaborate with many of my Indian colleagues in projects in uh, Manipal. Um, and I asked them, did you make a CT scan? Because we are spoiled by the fact that we want always a CT scan. So in this case, I also would say I would like to have a CT scan if possible. No, that was done long ago. This is 2015 or something. The CT was not done. Exactly. Mm. Well, I, 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 and, and on a CT scan, I always look at the Hounsville units. Yes. If it's a stone, you know, how, how strong is that stone? Mm -hmm. But as you said, if you have a good ultrasound, a good uh, KUB, um, and the patient has complaints, it, it's like, it looks like an elephant. It walks like an elephant. It must be an elephant. So let's go for hunting it. Okay, your, your choice of treatment in this patient is going to be a PCNL, the way it looks like. Yeah, I would, I would go for that. No, um, and let's say, let's say I must, must honestly say so. You have PCNL, utroscopy, and shockwave. Uh -huh. um, there are always people that say, well, you know, the waiting list for PCNL is two months. Uh -huh. You can say, oh, maybe I can start with shockwave. And shockwave is not so bad, but you need to have a dedicated person in a dedicated center. Utroscopy, I would say, looking at that filling defect, it doesn't look like a very hard stone, mm -hmm. um, might always also be an option. Um, but again, it depends on how many cases do you do? What equipment do you have? Mm -hmm. So, but if I look at this, I would say PCNL. 
Hang how about you? Is he an L? Yes, uh, I think this would be a natural fit for a PCNL, and of course, in this day and age, we would be a mini, a smaller size, just to reduce the risk of um, bleeding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we, because uh, if you have a you know a, 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 an efficient fragmentation method like a high power laser, you can pretty much clear a three centimeter stone in about. So axis is undefined. Its axis is going to be PCNL. The majority of us do that. Okay, she underwent a right PCNL. She was stented at the time, and uh, and she developed a UTI in the post-operative period. She had an X-ray and an ultrasound in the immediate post-op, probably fourth or the fifth day. It was all normal. The stent was removed after six days. You see, this is a very common picture. I just, John, uh, it's a very common phenomenon that the patient is discharged on the third day. They come back on a seventh day or an eighth day with a raising temperature and some element of urinary symptomatology with a stent in C2. What will be your approach in these patients? So if the patient has a stent, the question is, does she really have significant fever? Does she need to be admitted? Mm -hmm. You know, and do you need to train the bladder? So I would need to have a little bit more of information about what her normal voiding would be. You know, it would be stupid just to focus on that kidney and that stone if she has a bladder problem. Okay. Um, and if you want to treat with antibiotics, I don't care so much if they stand in place, but I want to be sure that there is a proper drainage. So maybe I would give a transurethral catheter and I would admit her. I would go here for um, uh, with, with a low, um, um, and, uh, well, I, I would admit her early. I wouldn't say, well, you know, give you antibiotics, so you come home, come back tomorrow. Okay, let me ask you a direct question. Question is, what is your role of thinking of removing a stent as a cause of temperature if it is temperature is persistent? Uh... <laughs> So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't directly remove it because if you inserted the stent, the question is, did you insert it because you still think there are small fragments left? That's one. Mm -hmm. The second thing, it was a perk. So your manipulation in the ureter was not significant. So you could remove it. But it would be a little bit awkward if you remove the stent and then you have to go back because there is a small fragment in the ureter that you cannot see on the KUB. Because if I look at the KUB, it's all gray for me. Yes. I cannot see a stone there. And not the sound you may miss it. Yes. So I might feel uncomfortable if the patient has fever, comes back at the day two, and I say, hey, let's take out the double J stand and everything will be fine. I wouldn't do, you believe, I wouldn't do that. Do you believe that a foreign body in, as a stand inside can cause temperature sometimes? Because this is one thing which revolves around majority of the urologists and uh, a day or two if the temperature doesn't settle they take out a stent when they are sure that there is no of course i understand that they are sure that there is no residual catheter. Yeah, so to be very honest now that you ask it like this yes you want to hear the answer that yes, it's sorry. not a double j <laughs> <laughs> it's not a double j oh, i agree <laughs> i agree with you <laughs> it's, it's not okay but i hope i i responded well yeah, okay, thank you. And Good. then she, this she underwent, she was all right after the stent was removed. After two months, she developed with the recurrence of a pain. One episode of UTI, persistent pain for a month, which made her to look into a CT scan after she came here at the time, uh, after to another hospital. And this was the CT scan picture at that point of time, within two months. Why this sort of a recurrence? Has you ask me again? Yes, of course. Oh, well, wonderful. The primary, primary question is yours, always. So I, I, it, I don't know which stone that she had. For okay. example, I remember a patient on cystinuria mm -hmm. also has a low Hounsfield unit. You cannot see that properly. Mm -hmm. I had a patient, I did a PCNL, and I didn't give enough fluid intraoperative and postoperative. And the next day, the patient even had a bigger stone on okay. the CT scan than before. So you can have a rapid regrowth of the stone. The issue is why in that right system? Mm -hmm. So I would question if you really made a patient stone free. Can you see all the stones on ultrasound well? Well, mm -hmm. if the patient has a lot of bowel gas, it may be difficult. And can you see everything on a plain abdominal x-ray? I question that. Okay. So I would say the patient had a stone and, and had a recurrence because of that. 
Hang, you, you echo the same sentiments? Yes, in fact, I've got a very similar patient who we cleared with a PCNL. We thought we cleared. Mm. It was a small fragment, and lo and behold, I think a year later, the whole stone recurred. Okay. So we think that you have to really sterilize the urine and clear mm. all the stones, which is what we did for her the next time she came back. Okay. So, okay, this is, this is what we did. We did a pre PCNL at this point, and this is how the stone looks like. John, now you tell me what could have been the reason for the recurrence so rap rapidly. This is not a cysteine stone, I'm sure about it. No, 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 no. It's not a cysteine stone. It looks like a typical infectious stone. Okay. So, so how are going to go about in these patients now? I presume the patient comes from India. Then <laughs> 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 I can presume you see a lot of diabetes there. A pill necrosis, you know. It can be a factor that is, is influencing this. So, I think I think your your net is a little weak. I think we're losing him. Yeah. Hang, how about you? How about you? You, you think that this is going to be an infective stone and how are we going to manage this? Yeah. Case? So I think the first thing is uh, I would follow up with a CT. I really want to clear all the stones and um, here we have the privilege, of course, of going back in with a flexible ureteroscopy just to clear the stones as we need. Mm -hmm. And this is what we actually were doing with my patient. Mm -hmm. uh, but we managed to clear her the second time. So we, are, we were very careful. We thought, you know, you leave a little bit behind, shouldn't matter, we give a bit longer antibiotics. But, you know, this, these things come back. So we come back. learn from experience. How, yeah. how, about, how about you, uh, uh, John? Yeah, John has come back. Yep. Yeah. John, audible. Yes, yes. Okay. Somebody wanted to kick me out. I don't know why. No way, no way. Nobody can <laughs> even think about it, even dream of it. <laughs> okay. I just want to have a specific question. Looking at this as an infective stone, what will be your advice in the post-operative period for this patient? First of all, you need to get rid of all the stones. Okay. That, that is, makes sense. And I like the fact that you go with flexible instruments to check if the stone... Okay. I, I saw your other question about should you give long-term antibiotics. Yes. I believe more in shorter-term antibiotics because otherwise you have a patient who has all kind of resistant bugs running around with them, and that patient will get another stone for sure. Okay. The second thing is you need to have a high fluid intake. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is beyond any discussion uh, the good one. And then you need to go for the stone analysis and see what, what it is. It will be an infectious stone. But high fluid intake, I don't think that irrigation of the renal pelvis will help. Uh, it's a role of antibiotic irrigation. I don't think so. And if you say to me, you should do it, then bring me data. Bring me evidence that it works. No, I'm not. I'm not asking that. But the question is, it has been described in the previous literature without a, without a randomized studies. As I said, like a chemolysis, which was done once upon a time, renacidin was used for screw white stones to prevent. Is there any role of that sort of a situation? Now, no. you put an aprostomy and put an irrigation there, which prevents this further stone. Because this is a second stone in a very short period of time. That's the reason why yeah. I asked. So what so I would say, make, make the patient stone free, mm -hmm. treat properly with antibiotics for up to a week maximally, mm -hmm. get rid of all the tubes, and then let the patient drink a lot and control the diabetes. Okay. You know. Okay. Okay. And treat the infections early if at all if they persist. Look for them. Yeah. Okay. okay. Just to with the with the question on pertinent to this, uh, Malik sir, and uh, anybody can answer this. Is it necessary to take a stone culture and a urine culture intraoperatively, even if you have a negative culture before you start PCNL? Uh, yes, yeah. I would say definitely yes. So we always take a stone culture, uh, and, and it's not just from the, the peripheral part of the stone, it has to be somewhere close to the core. That's where you can have a nidus of infection that you don't miss on your culture. And we, we take that, and then we culture it. So if the patient develops fever afterwards, we know how we have to readjust our antibiotic schedule. Okay, right. thank you. So I'll go to the next case. It's a 58-year-old it's a male, left flank pain. This is a stone and that is an IVP. Which, which, which calyx you puncture? Let me have a look. It's a terrible case, by the way. 
I will puncture the one that I have the easiest access to. Which one? Is it upper cervix? <laughs> so, I, I must be very honest. I normally would choose the lower pole because the lower pole always makes me feel a little bit safe. Secondly, I puncture in the supine position. Mm -hmm. I rarely do prone. Mm -hmm. So in the supine, the lower pole would be for me the easiest way yes. to go. I understand. But is there anything again is going in the upper calyx in this patient? Well, if, if you... Um, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> That's what I did. Okay. What we did is we did an um, a PCNL in this patient. We had upper calyxal puncture, but we couldn't re get into the pelvis. We couldn't see the uh, opening of the infant develop. So we left a nephrostomy inside. And then we did a lower calyxal puncture and cleared the stone fortunately, which is absolutely clear. And they've kept a stent inside. Now this is the nephrostogram in the immediate postoperative period after five days or six days. What will you do now? Well, uh, obviously the upper pole is a problem. Um, the question is if that upper moiety can be rescued. Mm -hmm. That's always the question if you have it like this. So when I was younger, I always thought I can do that, you know. If there is somewhere stenosis, I can, I can, I can rescue it. I dilate. I put in the big stand. But reality learned to me with wisdom and age that that often is an illusion. So you can try to do that, but the reality is that it's a minimal invasive approach to dilate a uh, a narrow infant nibbling, but often it recurs. And then the question is. If the patient has no complaints, has no infections, that part of the kidney is lost, should I remove it or should I let it? And sometimes the wisdom says, let it, follow it, and if there are no complaints. And if there are complaints, maybe you need to go for a next step. So I'm interested to see what, you do, what you're doing. I, I just tried to poke the into the infant development with a long with a with a 10 to 15 days of resting of the upper calyx, but I could not find anything. I just did a what I did was I just punctured the uh, the infant development of the upper calyx blindly onto the urotic catheter, touched the urotic catheter, catheter, passed the guide wire and passed the dilator across into the pelvis. Well, that was how what ha has happened, and uh, and that's how we are looking into the ureter. And I made an infundibulotomy through this mucosa at that place and passed a stent across that uh, uh, incised infundibula, which was a very dangerous and tricky situation. I don't say that it is the way it has to be done. My only question is, we do tend to do this sort of decisions many a time by doing a laser urotrotomies, laser infundibulotomies, either urotroscopically or by percutaneous way also. What will be your thinking regarding the long-term Potency rates. You said in your wisdom already it is not so, but what will be your thinking about a long term potency rates in these sort of situations? Will they be patent at all? Yeah. So the first thing I would like to say when you incise that infant dibulum, don't try to do it circular. Try to, it's like a star, try yes. to incise at three points mm -hmm. because otherwise, if you go very deep, it can start significant bleeding. I had it, you know. So just three points, and, and then it opens up. The second thing is the patency. I would, I have no data on that because I didn't treat hundreds of patients, but I would say one to two out of 10 will come out okay, but the other eight, they recur, whatever you do. So I, I would say, don't be disappointed if you fail. You know, <laughs> but try it. You can try it. You don't lose anything. And the second, what I was thinking, to find access to that place, I, I think you did it very elegant. The transurethral by ultroscopy and percutaneous. And then the question is, if you would inject some blue in either the renal pelvis or in the uh, uh, um, in that upper pole, uh, maybe you can see where the access is. Mm -hmm. That's what I would do. That's what I learned for uh, narrowings to, to see them. But I think that was very difficult here to see that. Yeah, them. that was not possible and I couldn't see. That's the reason why we had to do that. But only one thing which I wanted to convey is the long-term potency of these sort of things. 
we are not sure these are all endourological means of circumventing the problem temporarily i don't think they'll work out for permanent forever forever but uh, close follow up of all these patients is necessary okay we'll go to the next case so so you say this are the um indian patients really coming back when you tell them you have to come back after three months six months because the experience often what I hear from friends all around the world is say, okay, patient is done. He doesn't show up anymore. So how does it in India? Most of the time they end up with the next urologist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not the same urologist. What you need to tell them, you have to need to tell them that you are the best and all the others cannot do a better job. See, the very, maybe fact, they come back. very fact you are asking him to come back, that itself means that this is a failure of the first surgery. Okay. That, that, okay. is, that is the terminology in India. If you are re-exploring, that means it's a failed first surgery. If you are doing one more procedure, it means it's a failed first surgery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll go to this next case. Equivocal PUJ with stone. A 50-year-old male, right flank pain. CT scan shows a right low-lying kidney. You can see a little low-lying kidney, a baggy pelvis, and a mobile stone inside the pelvis. You need any more investigation? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll give you one. I gave you this. Okay. A rarity nowadays, but I gave you this. Uh, they call this in the past a balloon on a string. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So when when I see a case like this, how old was the patient again? He's fifty six. Fifty six. So I looked at the parenchyma. The parenchyma looked rather well, isn't absolutely it? Normal, absolutely normal. It's an so, external baggie. The calluses are absolutely hardly any dilatation of the calluses. Yeah. So I'm asking this because you may say, what is the function of that kidney? And do you need to do a UPJ repair? Okay. I would say if, if the kidney is doing fine, don't touch the UPJ. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think so. The second thing is, what you also know is if you go in by ultroscopy, it may be challenging, you know, because you have this narrow part of the UPJ. And maybe there might be a little bit higher insertion. But on the other hand, if I looked on your CT scan, <laughs> there is a little bit of bowel uh, close to that, that kidney. So that's also not easy. So uh, it's, whatever you do, it's not easy here. And then some of my friends, they would say, well, if you go for something, think about something laparoscopically even, you know. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm really interested to see which magic you did in your place. Okay. What is your choice in these patients? You see, we see this sort of a equivocal UPJ-like things, baggy pelvis, calluses are absolutely fine. The patient is a 56 or a 57. The parenchyma is very well. How do you manage these stones here? But actually, if you look at the CT scan, there is a potentially an approach to a PCNL for this patient mm -hmm. uh, through the back. You know, it's a fairly good window. Mm -hmm. uh, if I were to do this, I'd probably do an ultrasound on table, make sure the bowel is not flopping in the way mm -hmm. before I start. So where do you see that window, if I may ask? This is uh, around there. Yeah, around there. Yeah. Yeah, but there's muscle, isn't it? That's a muscle here. Yeah, but and, and what? That's a ball here. That's a ball here. Yes, and what is there between the kidney and the muscle? That's that's a fat. Oh, that, ball, no, no. Ball ends here. Ball ends here. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. But what is there? A little bit. Yeah, what is that? That, that, that. What's that? This is this is fat. Yes, and and in front of the fat. That's a kidney parenchyma. Oh, okay. That's a that's a back. Yeah, yeah. It's a ballooned out pelvis. That's a kidney parenchyma yeah. like this. Yeah. You shape Paris. It's a rotated kidney. Right. Right. Can, can I ask all three of you? Somebody has asked. They, would you prefer to do whatever you decide to do after this as an investigation? If you're deciding PCNL, is this a case for prone or supine? Malik, sir, in your opinion, as of whenever there is a whenever there is a controversial positional problems, I would go for a prone. Mr. Heng? Uh, I would. I will actually do supine because that's my trend now. Uh, but okay. again, uh, my, my caveat is I will make sure I do an ultrasound on table to make sure the window is correct. Yeah. And, and Prof, can I uh, add one more incentive? Say, would you like to do an ECRS in this case? <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I have to be very honest. I would also go in prone. That is strange, but I would feel more comfortable. Even though I do most of them supine, say 95%, in, the, in challenging cases, I go still in prone. Okay. And so, yes, ultrasound. You need to have a good ultrasound. But, but the point is, will you look at, even if there is a low-lying uh, UPJ, will you look at doing a flexible erythroscopy and fragmenting the stone with this sort of an extra renal pelvis? That's a point which I wanted to ask you. No. You know, you have a big floating stone, then you will have multiple nice floating stones. <laughs> <laughs> so no. extraction no, of the kettle is very important. You can be stupid, but don't even be more stupid than I would be. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did the same PCNL in a mini perk, which we did at a, at a floral guided puncture, and we cleared the stone with a uh, mini perk itself. That's a, that's a puncture. And uh, the straight way into it, and then get, getting into it and clearing the stone completely at the end. <laughs> so that was, that was a mini puncture. So the point is, whenever you have a fine, baggy, large, baggy pelvis, it's better to do a mini perk and fragment the stone rather than look for, uh, uh, look for a flexible erythroscopy as a fashion. That's exactly what we wanted to discuss. Coming to the last case, a 26-year-old, 18 so, weeks. So, so what, what would you say if somebody is going to do a laparoscopic case, there's a pyeloplasty and removes the stone? I don't want to touch the UPJ, wherein whenever we find a fair good drainage, which is seen on your isotope scan, and that too in a 56-year-old, calyx is well-preserved, thick, thickness of the parenchyma is very well-preserved, and I don't think I need to do anything for that UPJ. I probably create an obstruction rather than relieving the obstruction. Fully agree. Good. So that's a primary with a renal colic, 26 year old, 18 weeks gestation, left renal colic, one episode of fever, passed the calculus five years ago. Ultrasound shows the left hydroeurotronephrosis up to the upper ureter. Right side shows a mild fullness of the PCS, which is physiological, and the PLC, the total leukocyte count, was high. How do you manage this, sir? Uh, again. Don't you have easy cases for me? <laughs> it's very easy, is it not? <laughs> so, the first thing is when the leukocyte count is up, uh, what you don't want to lose the baby or even the patient. So in these cases, if you have a call it obstructing stone on that left side, in my in my place, I would put in a percutaneous drain and okay. drain that system. How about how about a stent? I, I wouldn't do that. I would. You can do a stent, but I feel more comfortable by percutaneous drain. Why? Because you are really sure that the urine is being drained from that system. And number two, you can see if pus is coming out uh, in a stent. It, it, you can do it, but it's not. Maybe not. I don't have any data on that, but I prefer a percutaneous drain. How about it's you? Less Sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. I would probably percutaneous drain this patient. I think the concern if I had worked with a stent is that if there is any ongoing sepsis, you know that the patient who's pregnant will have some hydronephrosis from the enlarged uterus anyway. No, I, so that I'm, complicates I'm your diagnosis. In yeah. I'm only concerned about one thing. You put a percutaneous drain now into the kidney, then what? She is just 16 weeks pregnant. She has got another five months to go. Yeah, but yeah. so yes, so she right. suffers with the PCN until the baby comes out before you do anything else. Yeah. So that's the consideration that we discuss with our patient if that's the yeah. option. Yeah. So the discussion with the patient is I, I had that several times, maybe five or ten cases. The discussion is, and, and indeed it's a short period, are you gonna wait until you, you, you drain that system and you still can do a ureteroscopy. Are you going to leave in a double J stand until delivery? No, because it's most commonly coming out calcified. It's not draining. So you drain the upper system and then you're going to discuss if you can go for surgery. I would go for a ureteroscopy to treat that system. Okay, I, I got the point now. Yeah. We have treated with antibiotics. She settled and the fever became less and the next day, and we got a repeat ultrasound which shows and identifies a uretric stone in the bit ureter. Will you be doing a ureteroscopy directly now, once the fever set in? Yes. So the first I will discuss with her and let and don't push her. 
I would say cool a little bit down and she will notice that this double J is not very nice and, 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 and she wants to have the next treatment because any manipulation that you do with your ultroscopy can again initiate early delivery and abortion and you don't want that. So you have time to discuss with her and I would not rush it and say, well, this would be my next step. Discuss with the anesthesiologist. You're not going to use X-ray for the ultroscopy. Yes. You go in with a semi-rigid mm -hmm. and then maybe immediately with a flexible and treat that stone and that's it. Okay. So what we did, we did an underwent a double just stent at the time of infection. We didn't uh, take, we just did it under local anesthesia. And then if at all, if you're going to do it, when do you plan it? You said you discuss, when do you plan? Is there any specified time period during which you plan the definitive treatment? Because she can't have a stent for the next five months. Yes. Plus a stent is going to cause irritation. It can also initiate uh, early contractions. Mm -hmm. So I, I would discuss with the anesthesiologist if you feel safe to bring her under anesthesia. Maybe you can even do it under spinal, mm -hmm. you know. And I would go in by utroscopy, seam rigid, flexible, and treat that stone. Okay. Is there, is there any, I just asked the same question again, the fashion of putting long-term antibiotics in patients who are on stents. It's, it's, it's become a fashion now where the patients are kept on alpha blockers and antibiotics on long-term basis. What's your opinion on that? So first of all, alpha blockers, of you're gonna, in a pregnant woman, they are of label use. So if afterwards there's something wrong with the baby, for sure, that doesn't look good on you when you meet the lawyers of the patient. <laughs> the not second good. thing with, with antibiotics, it's the same. I don't think that long-term antibiotics, I think if you drain, that's when you solve the problem and you should only use antibiotics functionally. I would say maximally, if she has high fever, maximally for a week, wait for the culture. And if you have the culture available and she develops again problems, you can very targeted treat, but don't continue for a long term for weeks and months. I wouldn't do that, but I also can be wrong. But that's oh, I, I the concept. I just want to know, not only in pregnancy, I'm talking about in general, in general, like majority of the majority of the people are looking at putting them on a small dose of low dose uh, nitroferentoin or a low dose uh, trimethoprim, something when there is a foreign body inside, prevent thinking that it prevents infections, etc. What is the what is the answer for that from you, John? I wouldn't do it. OK, hang. how about you? Uh, I wouldn't do it either. I guess I think the, the concept here is whether your there are biofilms forming on the stents and there are potential hiding spots for the bacteria. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's clear data to show either way. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've pretty much sterilized the urine, um, the infection should go away. I think the way I would approach it for how I practice is that if the patient declares himself as having recurrent infections and I'm worried there is a biofilm, I will change the stent. But other than that, as a routine, no real long-term antibiotics. Leave the stand and leave it to stay for the for the duration I need it. Yeah, wonderful. I think I think that clears the question of a long-term antibiotic in majority of these individuals. How about an alpha blocker, John? Routine alpha blocker in males or people in to decrease one is to decrease the uh, to decrease the bladder symptoms because of the stent and decrease the bladder pressures and reflux and urinary tract infection that can happen with uh, stents. What's your, what's your <clears throat> idea on that? Listen, I, I remember the discussion initially for stones in general. Yes, it would work in everything. Then suddenly a nice randomized study, another randomized study, another, and then suddenly that window is shrinking, 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 shrinking. Actually, I, I don't really believe in alpha blockers and using them. Um, the only way you prove me is coming with solid data, and they are really lacking. So I would say, for me, the indication for alpha blockers are limited. It's like somebody said, if you have a sore throat, if you give antibiotics, it's over in a week. And if you don't do anything, it takes only seven days. <laughs> hey, how about you, alpha blockers? Because they've become like aspirin for yeah. cardiologists. Tamsulosin so, has become for urologists nowadays. For me, for stents, it's not a routine. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, for stent symptoms, I usually go by what the patient has and give anticholinergics as needed. 
But as a routine, I, I think if you, if you prime them that they have some symptoms, most of them actually tolerate it without additional medication. Yeah, that, that's my... And I think the latest ones, the newer ones, are softer than what we used to have 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So the sense symptoms are much lesser. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. From my cases are over. Vinny, do you want to present yours? Uh, sure. Uh, if, uh, Prof, you are uh, still up to one more case. We love it. We love it. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll just... have an opinion, no problem. Okay. <laughs> so this is a, a quick case. This is... You know, you, know the, you know the opinion, the, 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 the saying about opinions, eh? Opinions yeah. <laughs> are assholes. Everybody has one. <laughs> so, so like Malik, sir, even I have a female who's 55, and she came in with a left colic in April. We treated her with analgesia antibiotics because she had a positive culture then. And we saw the CT scan. Uh, we always do a CT scan in standard. There's a stone in the lower pole, as you can see, about 1.9 centimeters. Uh, and then there's the upper pole stone, which is also reported to be about 1.1 centimeter. A little bit of infection going on, which was well controlled. So the options again for this, um, it still would be PCNL for you, Prof? Uh, yes. I, so what I would do is, in general, a case like this, I put it in supine position for combined approach. So okay. I would go with a perk, but I would look with your utroscopy. So which means you need two people and you double the cost. But I would feel very comfortable in this case. But if you would just go by PCNL, I also would be happy. Okay. So if you were going with the PCNL, my concern, uh, Malik, sir, if, if you do a mini PCNL and the stone is in the other pole, we'll have to puncture again. Do you think it's better we go with a bigger sense so we can put a nephroscope inside? Flexible nephroscope? I can, I can, I can pass a flexible urethroscope through the mini perk because it's not a very big stone burden. I just need to dislodge right. it. So either two aspects. One, put a needle into that calyx, flush the stone into the pelvis, or if there is a mini perk sheet, you pass a flexible urethroscope. The vision will not be great, but it will, it will be one option. I don't think I need to do a one more puncture for that sort of a small stone per se. Okay. Rather, I would do a flexible urethroscopy, put the push the stone into the pelvis, and then do a ECRS or a or a mini perk at the at the same time. Mr. Heng, would you consider uh, once he recovers an ESW uh, Hounsfield or not too much? Uh, if she doesn't want surgery, anything is possible. But I think the, <laughs> the, the, the risk, especially for the lower pole, because the infundal pelvic angle isn't ideal, you're going to have a lot of re residual stones. Okay, so, so I think in order to be and it's detected, this, I, would, I would try and clear the stone. Yeah. Okay, all right. So um, uh, we went on, uh, we treated her. And then, of course, because of COVID, which I think has affected everybody, the stone, um, one of the stones, the one which is in the upper pole, fell down and had grown in size. So, um, uh, Prof, what would you like to do now? Yeah. So, so I got surgery time. I can do surgery irrespective of COVID now. <clears throat> For the, I, I would first treat the one that, that is symptomatic. That's at lower pole stone. Uh, the the, the disodorator stone. You can wait, of course, but it's a rather big stone. Uh, uh, forget about alpha blockers that should not work. So I would go for a quick and, 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 and not too dirty urethroscopy. So oddly, you see, there's not much of a dilatation in the kidney. And she came in with actually quite asymptomatic. This was basically more of a teleconsult that we had. Um, so I, I, I think at this point, we will aim to discuss with her. Amalik, sir, would it be correct to say uh, urethroscopy, no. maybe CNL or just go in for both? No, no, I think, I think, you see, whatever you're convenient with, you have to go ahead and go ahead. Once we are going ahead, get finish the stone and complete it rather than pending it to the next sitting. And Dr. Hing, this would be good to do a supine position because you can tackle both if you can, yeah. not in the prone. I, I, correct. If we can do an ECRS, I'd be happy to try with this patient. Yeah. Okay. What is so she was, she was agreeable, but her only condition was I only want one surgery. So she was counseled for ECRS and mini PCNL. The culture, even though she was asymptomatic, was still positive after three months. So we treated with antibiotics under cover all the way till up. So now that we know that it's a positive culture, the location of the stone, uh, Mr. Heng, what, what do you think is a good enough size for her, for puncture? As in, in mini PCNL, would you prefer a 14, a 16, or 18? No, I think a 16, 15, 16 is uh, fair enough if you are doing a mini PCNL. Uh, so long as it, I think what we notice is that if you are draining the system and the pressure doesn't build up, uh, 
our infection rates don't seem to be higher. We haven't collected the data, but the impression is that so long as the pressures don't go up, if you do a RIRS, the pressures are high, you're higher risk of infection. But if you're sticking a, 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 a PCNL, it's draining the system, it's keeping it low pressure. Uh, the risk of infection post op actually, we feel it goes down. Right. Malik, sir, would you do a CT urogram again, um, uh, keeping the, not necessary, right? Yeah, to fit, yeah. Okay. So basically, then we, we, this is what happened. We took it up for surgery and there was no stone below. So despite it being a bit stone, it had passed. Now, in the first RPG over here, we see the guide wire, which is going all the way, which basically tells you it's a very dilated system. And then obviously, it's a capacious cross hydronephrosis. And um, Prof. Um, uh, Jean, we see that my ureteroscope actually reaches all the way over here. I used a little view. So the question at this point, two. One, should I be continuing with my RIRS? Uh, and if I am, then is there a particular scope that I should be not using or using? Oh, well, it's obviously once you're there, you get excited, you uh, launch your laser and you say, let's go for it. Uh, you remember it was 800 hound speed. 100? 800. 800. Well, that's in the middle, <laughs> somewhere in the middle. Well, right. if, you feel, if, you, if you feel comfortable to treat by utroscopy, I, I think you can continue. Okay. You know, but you need to know the fact that she, she wanted only one procedure, wasn't it? That's right. So you need to be sure that you make a stone free. So you may be taking a little bit longer surgery time by utroscopy. So the, the thing is that, let's say I decided on an area. This is some there. I see the stone. I have a good laser, high power laser. Um, I would assume to, if I'm saying that it's correct to use an access sheet for sure for her. Yes, a yes, definitely access sheet. And, and have you any experience with a suction access sheet? Do you think that's better than any other access sheet or it's no big deal? Me personally have no experience with the uh, suction access sheet. Okay. So I can comment on it. And, and, uh, and the type of scope, um, is there, um, you know, disposable versus reusable, any controversy on that or whichever you have access to because you're already there anyways? Yes. Yeah, so if you're using a single use scope, it would not be smart to change it for a reuse because it's already gone. So if you think that you can do it with a reuse, a single use, I mean, you can do it. So a single use should be okay for a one and a half hour procedure or so. So we'll just the, reason, to use it. the reason I ask that is because if I'm going to do RIRS here and I need to render a stone free, I'm going to be probably extracting the stone fragments and using baskets. So I'm a bit concerned when we go in and out with the reusable scope, that accordion effect. So I've moved away to do a disposable more often than not. But in your experience, um, anything similar that you've had where scopes have got stuck because with a basket you're moving in and out? So... I tell you very honestly, the literature says more or less, if you, has more, if you have more difficult stones, use a single-use one. If you have the easy ones, use the beautiful digital scopes of Storz, Olympus, or Wolf. I think this is a strange statement because the best scopes are still the reusable scopes from Storz, Wolf, and Olympus. So if I would treat that patient, I would use for that patient a, uh, either Storz or Olympus, that's what I'm using. And uh, my experience with thoughts is very good with the digital ones. If I cannot reach that angle very well, I will use the fiber optics because the fiber optics is still the one with the biggest flexibility and still the vision is excellent now with the number of high uh, fiber count. So nice. making a strategy in the beginning, you say, well, there's a lower pole stone, may be difficult to reach, let me use a digital, digital scope. If that is not okay, I go for the fiber optics. So we, we, we went ahead since we were there. We <clears throat> used a high power uh, laser. We used the Moses laser. And uh, I mean, uh, I managed to clear up all the stones. It took about 30 minutes to fragment it. I took out a piece for analysis and then I shifted to uh, pop dusting. So my choice is to use pop dusting once I've you know, fragmented all the stones and got something what I need for sample and then I shift. Uh, do you think that that's a good option for almost all stones to be using uh, high frequency, high energy in RIRS or break them and just extract them? Why do you need a high power laser? Well, there is not such 
such a something like a standard case that you say, I do this always, I do it. So you adapt depending on that stone for each case. So in your oh. judgment, depends on the Huntsville units, the size. Is it one stone in the lower pole? Are it multiple stones? Every time you go in with the basket and you come out, basket come out, that is very tedious. So I would try to make them as small as possible. But the issue is, can you flush them out from that lower pole? So for this, you should try to flush them out, but you may not be successful. So maybe you will have still some very small fragments in it. So you have to accept that. But then you have to say to the lady, you're stone free. So you see this picture on the right, which says RBG says no filling defect. Um, is this good enough for me to be sure? I mean, I'm looking at that area I, and there's a lot of dust. I can't see any obvious fragments. I do this RPG. Is this fair enough for me to say, okay, I'm done with the procedure, confidently put a stent? Is that how you also decide in your practice or is there something else that you decide? So my experience is, strangely enough, if I see a lot of small fragments, I am worried. Will they flesh out? And if I go back after three to six weeks, I'm surprised the system looks like virgin, like fresh, like new. I never was there. You know, so most fragments indeed flesh out. But you cannot okay. say it always works like this. So, Malik, so, you know, we took a, we did the CT scan in a month's time, which we normally do for all these stones when we put a stent. And now I see this fragments which I hear, which I couldn't see before. What, what would I do, sir? <laughs> okay. And I'm not sure if he's, if he's there. So, uh, Mr. Haig, what would you do? As you know, normally the patient goes back to another doctor. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, well, well Mr. Dr. Heng, what would you do, sir? I think we have a long discussion with the patient, what, what she expects. Because, you know, cool. right and again, uh, to not clear again would be even worse than to leave it alone. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, at these sort of situations, I discuss with the patient, ask them, what, what is the expectations? Yeah, uh, because she... The, she, she the, came first time, the first time of one procedure, clear everything, we didn't hit that. So anything we do, we need to stay. She needs to be clear that we, if, if we don't deliver, what happens? Yeah. Okay, so I basically uh, very true. The discussion is always with the patient, and then the the thing that we had, did, what we do in practice and prof is that we actually look at the bone window. So when we look at the bone window, this is the stent. It's obvious. And then I start to see a lot of dust. And of course, it could be a fragment, but it looks very, very faint compared to a normal abdominal window. And uh, I'm just going to be uh, taking off the stent after discussing the patient that, you know, that could fall. Uh, do you use bone window at all, uh, Prof? I no experience with that. Sorry. Okay. So we, I think it's underutilized or because there's no uh, real critical uh, reviews to say that this is reliable or unreliable. But uh, Mr. Eng, would you agree that in our practice, since we are together, um, yeah, yeah. this has been very reliable in most of the instances? Right. So looking at the bone window, which essentially just highlights the higher Huntsville units, uh, it does tend to give us a bit more reassurance that the fragments are smaller than what the normal uh, ab abdominal window will show. Yeah, I think, yeah it's also given me a sense of uh, confidence to say which ones will pass for sure. And I probably based on that, and then, you know, we did a CT scan three months later, and then uh, it was fine. There was uh, absolutely no stones inside, and the, she didn't have any issues at all. So she did well. I'm glad she did well at all. I uh, just wanted to highlight to, you know, all the um, uh, wonderful set of people who have um, logged in with us. Uh, there's a big number of questions we've been asking, a lot of questions. Uh, I've just we've covered most of them. Actually, Dr. Malik had to excuse himself because he starts with an oration somewhere else. So on his behalf, um, I take this opportunity to personally thank both of you. And uh, before we, we finish the session, Mr. Heng, is there something uh, that you would like to share in your uh, take home from all this a wonderful discussion that we've had? Well, no, first I'd, I'd like to thank uh... Dr. De La Reset for an excellent talk because you've actually summarized what I was concerned about with Crows is that, you know, there's so much data out there and uh, what Crows does is it looked at it in a different way, which was very helpful in my practice because sometimes just the, the few centers uh, or the, the studies which look at just a few centers do 
tend to skew the information slightly. So it was very good to have that kind of information. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I must honestly say that the true kings of stone surgery are in your area. So that's why I said I love to come back because the cases that you have are exceptional, but also the skills that you have are extraordinary. So I uh, salute all of you with a lot of respect. And I hope that everything related to COVID is soon over so I can come and enjoy all your skills. Sure, we, we, we will uh, uh, hope to see you again and uh, we'll enjoy the Singapore chili crab also with you when you come. And if you go to in India after a hard task day, I'm sure Malik sir will get you to some good biryani because that's famous in his place. <laughs> Okay. So with that, um, thank you. Thank you to the um, uh, support team which has been with us. And Prof, uh, have a very good weekend and uh, take care. And uh, please pass our regards to Madam Pilar as well. And we'll hope to see you soon. Okay. Thank, you, thank, so, you, thank you so much. Thank you so bye much. Bye. Have a good weekend and uh, see you soon. Thank take you. care. Bye-bye. Thank you to all the viewers. Thank you very much.